So um, I, I think the easiest way is just to start, and the first thing, which is the, the important thing to start, I think, is to give each of these people here the possibility to introduce themselves and give you a little bit of uh, overview of what, what they are doing and where they're from and what, what their, their blogs are about, because you may not know all of them. So let's start with Ali, please, and uh, give us a little information about where you're from. What you do. My name is Ali, I'm writing a blog on the German side of science blogs. Um, I'm by training, I'm a political scientist in international relations. So the connection with skepticism might not be that clear right from the beginning, but I I try to, to write it. It's at the borderline of, of social science and sometimes it's also more social or political commentary just need to find the right, right balance. And I often end up talking about conspiracy theories and a lot about religion and politics, which are probably the two topics that make the clearest, clearest link to, to the conference. Um, I don't know much about statics of buildings and <laughs> thermite, but I know a little bit about politics, and that's often enough to have something to say about these issues. My name is Julia Offer. I am from Hamburg. I'm a biologist and um, I also have one of the blogs on the German science blog. Um, actually, I, haven't, I, I started this blog, I think, about a, a year and a half ago. Uh, <laughs> and that, uh, because I thought we needed some information on science based parenting. But I haven't posted anything for quite some time now, for more than half a year, so there are some reasons for that, so if you're interested in the reasons for that, I will be happy to answer them and to discuss them. I'm Amy Stevens, I'm a co-host for the Rights and Invention podcast, which is a UK-based podcast. We interview um, people on there who are sidekicks, mediums, who are less critical than a lot of people here. Science blogs, 
I write mainly about astronomy and other science, but uh, in my opinion, if you want to communicate science to people, you also have to talk about the things that pretend to be science but are not, and you have to talk about the things that don't <coughs> oppose the science. This is why I also deal with a lot of different uh, skeptical topics. I write about the moon landing conspiracy, I write about uh, different types of pseudoscience. science, I write about uh, uh, doomsday prophecies for 2012, write about astrology, so a lot of different topics uh, which the people are really interested in. And that's also, I think, some of the part of the reason why I'm here. My name is Lars Fischer, I'm a training chemist, and currently I work as a science journalist for Spectrum der Wissenschaft, and I also run Spectrum der Wissenschaft science blogging platform, Silos. <laughs> um, and I have my own blog at Silos. As you may imagine, I blog about chemistry and related topics. And generally, I blog about part time, that is, my own publication, scientific publications, uh, current scientific research, scientific methods, and so on. Um, the reason I do that is because I think for skeptical thinking, a brain is not enough. What you need is knowledge and understanding and, of course, access to data, to methods, to, to the way scientists work. Only then you can be skeptical about, about science-related topics. If you don't know about science, skepticism won't, won't take you anywhere. Uh, hello guys, my name is Mark, as it says here. <laughs> First of all, let me say how awesome it is to be here with you guys because, I mean, you all know this in terms of blogging, skeptical blogging, scientific blogging. These are real VIPs, so this is <laughs> just great. So basically, no, compared to them, I, I'm small fry. Uh, I blog on the blog skepticalblog.ch with my friend Kevin, who's in the audience back there. Okay. And basically, what we do is we blog and criticize about all the crazy stuff that's going on in Switzerland, and there's plenty of crazy stuff. <laughs> Uh, politics. So, what connection? 
question you see between these two very, I think, broad issues. Um, when I write about uh, religion and politics, I think for me personally that's more on the commentary side usually, um, but I still think that there is a connection. Um, basically, I, I think, and this is something that can be disputed, but I think a lot about in a, in a democracy, a lot about the, of the public debate, discussions that are going on, um, are are important for the results. And to be able to have such a discussion, you need to start from the same basis. And I think this is where we find the link with um, skepticism. Because if, if you come up, if you argue for policies, um, not on the basis of, of evidence or facts, but out of a religious assumption, everyone who is not sharing this assumption is left out of that debate. And there you can get into trouble when you have a majority that shares this assumption and it's in fact the majority imposing, imposing that this view. And I think this for me is the link and probably also one of the reasons why I often write about religion and politics. Although, as I said, I think it's, it's a little bit more on the commentary side and not like conspiracy theory. I think we should put an idea out there that conspiracy theorists did 9 11. That would confuse everybody. Sorry. Conspiracy theorists did 9/11. Just put the idea out. Just see what happens. It doesn't confuse them. <laughs> Religion, it's a 
reinforce things like homophobia and other things that have a huge impact on our society. So this is why I try to deal with uh, these arguments for the existence of God. Because there are the people who believe in God just because they want to. Basically, the Bible is true because the Bible says so. And that's the end of it. And then there's the other people who believe in God, try to reason themselves into believing in God with uh, philosophy and reason and pseudoscience. So I think it's important to try and convince them that they're wrong. Okay. And, and it, it is, a, I mean, it's, it's a, an issue where, where a lot of people are emotionally very, uh, very, very soon, and often they are emotionally hurt when they hear something like that. And I think it's one of the most, um, most uh, important issues in the way that, that you must get a lot of feedback because of this, of this of dance. Isn't it? Or isn't it? Or let, it, let, it let me explain it like this. I talk about everything when I'm talking with people. Philosophy, politics, religion, that's no problem. But when I'm writing a blog post, I really think twice if I'm going to say something about religion because I just don't want to get in this discussion. You know? And be um, called the dick. Sorry? And be called the dick. Like Field Play, there was this entire controversy about the being the dick speech. Yeah. That's uh, basically being aggressive towards people who are religious is uh, rude and non productive. And uh, at, at the time meeting in Las Vegas, I said that we have to find a middle ground between being a dick and being a pussy because you cannot <laughs> give power either. You're not going to get anything done. When you criticize deep-rooted beliefs, such as religion, you will offend some people. They will feel offended. And yeah, you just have to deal with feedback. Okay, what are the others doing? What are you talking about religion in your blogs? I do, but uh, you can't. You can't avoid offending people. Some people are offended just by the existence of atheists. So <laughs> that's, that's a better one, right? Somebody will be offended by it. So uh, in my case, I write about religion, not so much as I write about uh, conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories, or pseudoscience and stuff like this. But yes, I, I think it's, uh, it's it's perfectly okay to have a opinion on religion and say this opinion publicly. So if it's an opinion that somebody doesn't like, that's it's not right in my problem. Okay. I tend to offend spiritualists a lot. Um, and I don't intend to, they just say it's very well they're not all touchy, they're some of the um, But it's usually when I'm writing about how some people call themselves spiritualists or Uh, you can very easily uh, 
explain why astrology is not science. There are a lot of different ways to explain this. Uh, one of the most basic is just uh, it's, it's more or less the same reason why science is nothing you have to believe in. Because science is something which uh, is based on logic, which is based on, on rationality, which uh, has to be consistent, which uh, changes, which can be wrong, which uh, can be adjusted. And astrology is, is none of this. Astrology is uh, just, it's, uh, it's totally inconsistent. For example, there are, the astrologers, they are working with uh, uh, nine planets, with, uh, the moon, the sun. <laughs> and that's it. But uh, there are a lot of other uh, celestial bodies in the solar system. There are some, I don't know, some, I don't know the exact number, but more than 70 other known moons, some of the biggest our own moon. There are a lot of uh, small planets, there are uh, big asteroids, there are uh, a lot of different uh, comments and stuff like this, and there is no reason why uh, this object should appear in the horoscope, because uh, the, the, the mass of the object cannot play a role, because uh, even small planets and big planets, they have the same influence in the horoscope, the distance of the Earth cannot play a role, because uh, the distant Pluto is as important as the close uh, mass, for example. So all this stuff uh, uh, plays a role, and it's, it's just because uh, the astrologers, they believe that these eight planets on the moon are important the horoscope because ancient people did it and when ancient did it you don't have to change it like like literature yeah, it's 2000 years ago somebody said something and you have to believe in it and nothing changes it's the same with astrology some people said something in the past and you do not change what these people say so astrology is no science astrology is totally inconsistent and but of course if you talk like this to astrologers then uh, they will write pages and pages of comments and explaining uh, uh, how there is some system behind this, uh, how they choose, uh, choose the, the planets. And uh, if you translate all this, this astrology, uh, this astrology language, in fact, it, uh, it boils down to uh, we believe in these planets because we always believe in these planets. But uh, they formulate in such a way that this, this, uh, that, uh, they, this is how the planets have a Influence with human uh, they sound people. reasonable when you're. They, they sound reasonable when you're in. So, and I think this is very important because 
there you will reach a lot of people at the point before they form their opinion. And you have a scientist blogging about his topic and yeah. Okay, I, I, I got it. So, so you mean to tell me that you don't aim to, to convince the hardcore believers, the, the gurus, the, the pseudo-scientific the, the, the leaders, which are anyway lost, but you aim for the, the ones they try to fish. So you hope that you, that you can, that you can uh, keep them away from, from, uh, from the wrong path. It does work. It does work. And there are, of course, in German TV, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, documentaries and, and uh, scientific shows about this uh, uh, doomsday prophecy. And uh, really, uh, if some of the shows is scared, I really, uh, the next day, I got 10, 20 emails uh, in my mailbox of people that I have seen the show and uh, I, I was because the world will end next year and I learned about it and I found a site and really uh, explained everything and now I, I know that this is uh, nonsense. So it, at least for some people it does work with me. Okay, so that's, that's a new information. That, that, I mean, this means you get reactions, you get reactions back, you get, you get comments back, which shows you that it at least makes a little bit sense what you do. Yeah? I also think that you can change the minds of hardcore believers. Maybe not the ones that are activists, uh, yeah, I mean, I was a hardcore believer, and I changed my mind. It's, it's not that hard. Uh, <laughs> it it doesn't I, hurt. Yeah, I mean, if I make a video response to something Kirk Cameron says, I obviously know I'm not going to change his mind, but I will probably change his mind, change the minds of some people who are watching him and are respecting him, and then think that, okay, this guy knows what he's saying, because he sounds like he knows what he's saying. When not. So that's my aim to these kinds of people. Okay. Uh, before we come to um, Julia, I think it makes sense because of the discussion that we talk to you, Lars. I mean, what we, what we heard here is that it makes sense to get all this information out there. It makes sense to, to make as long as, as, as long as information as possible available in the net. And uh, you made this um, petition, this open access petition uh, in Germany. Maybe can you explain a little bit for people here, or, or who, who knows what open access is? Okay, so it makes sense that you explain a little bit what, what, it, is, what it is all about, what open access means, and why you think that this is important and what it has to do with what we are talking here. Yeah? Well, I think uh, this is mainly the heart of the problem. It's about information. Open access means open access. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, the idea is, can everyone hear me properly when I talk like that? You can do that over the mic. Okay. Uh, the idea is that scientific journals, or the primary literature, should be open to everyone. Without, without restriction. At the moment, the restriction is purely financial. You have to pay out of your nose to get at the stuff. Um, and that's the heart of the problem, really, because um, everyone here says it's completely unreasonable to say uh, that science is just another belief system. You just have, you have to believe it. But uh, for many people, for those people who say that, that's actually true. Because science, as it is done today, is a black box. The universe goes in, and some, somehow science happens, and then wisdom comes out. And, no, <laughs> and, and uh, the stuff happening inside the black box is fairly complex, and it is hidden from you because. Uh, no one today has proper access to, to primary publications. One reason is, of course, primary publications are written in a difficult style, but the second, the second reason is that they are simply not accessible. So open access means cracking open the black box of science so people can see the difference between belief and science. And that's a very, very important thing. Well, my, my ultimate greatest success is that I actually get journalists, science journalists, 
to eat the actual papers they are money from. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are laughing, but uh, what do you think how many science news and the mass media are written by people who have read a paper before? <coughs> Practically not. It is absolutely accepted, uh, even for, for quality journalism, for, for large daily papers, uh, to accept articles about scientific issues where no one has actually read the paper. And I find that unacceptable and um, I'm regularly or regularly invited to, to discussions in journalistic circles about scientific blogging and I always stress that everyone who writes about science and talks about science today has, thanks to open access, in most cases a chance to get papers on the topic. And people should do that. And that's, um, there, there is a development in that direction. That's my pet peeve, of course. And people read those papers and people start to read those papers. Just, uh, just uh, we, have, we don't have too much time, then we can go on to the questions we have and uh, try to, to make the point very clear and okay. consensible. Um, my name is Ariel Gad, I come from Egypt originally, and I'm a blogger, I blog in Arabic, or Egyptian Arabic, speaking about scientific stuff, very simplified. I don't go into religion, but I try uh, to say things that are so scientific and that are totally uh, opposite to their religious ideas without any mention of religion. So I say, if you don't expose your body to the sun, you get quite vitamin D deficiency, and that's very bad for you. You get cancer, blah, blah. So it's a hint to those covered women, and so forth. Um, I just wanted to tell um, all of you that we are, we are so proud of you around the world, and there's a parallel universe called the Arab clothing sphere. And, um, there are thousands of people that converted and left religion because of Christina. And you're not <laughs> <one>. <laughs> Really important. <laughs> That's just what I'm 